All right, so I'm going to do this in just text mode. I don't really have slides. My slides are text files, so I hope that's cool with you guys. And if it's not, you can leave. <laughs> okay, so, so I'm Paul Ivanov. Um, that's my uh, contact information, and I'll be talking about IPython. I, I thought I'd give you guys an overview. There was already some questions that were starting of how come I can you know, CD in IPython, but that doesn't work in Python. I thought I'd give you guys an overview of what IPython gives you, and then get into sort of the structure of the different ways of using IPython, including the notebook and the Qt console, and just the console, um, and uh, go over that. And I have a little minor breakout that, that we can also do. So about myself, I'm a graduate student here. I'm getting to be a, a sort of a on the long side of graduate school. But uh, as far as the um, these tools, it's great to see 200 people here sort of joining the community. I think a lot of you are using these tools for the first time, and that's great. And this is just an overview of the of my contribution, sort of direct commit contributions. So uh, I do have uh, commit uh, rights to Matplotlib and IPython. Um, I also wrote a little thing called Vim IPython. If you're a Vim user, talk to me afterwards. Um, and so it's great to see all of you here. And so um, uh, I'll just move on. So there are many faces to IPython. And um, I'll just start off with everything that you can do within just the plain old IPython invocation. So if, you just, if you're just at a terminal and you just type in IPython, what you can do there. And so this is the, this is the notebook that I'll go over. And then further on, there's, there's some separation that we have. So, so there's sort of the basic IPython shell, which you can use as a replacement for the Python shell. And you can also use it sort of as a replacement for your system shell, your, your bash prompt or something like that, if you're familiar with Unix tools. Uh, and I'll, then I'll let you know what sort of separation makes it possible for you to run all of this over the notebook. And uh, so basically, there's a computational unit that's called the IPython kernel that's running all the stuff that you tell it to run. And you, you, we have different clients of talking down to those computational kernels. So one client is the, uh, you know, the notebook, the HTML notebook that allows you to talk to a kernel. But there's nothing stopping you from talking to the very same kernel using some local tools like a Qt console or a console. So that's sort of, that's the lay of the land. Um, and do uh, interrupt me if you have questions. About any of this. This is available in the GitHub repo. If you, it's up on the website. It's up on it's up on the website. I'm told. It's called Paul's intro. Paul's intro. Okay. So um, what is IPython? So primarily, for up until basically the last uh, up until basically a year ago, IPython was just a single process program that, are, that acted like a Python interpreter, but gave you extra things. And those extra things, and we call it a Python shell on steroids. Um, you can do anything in the Python shell uh, inside the IPython shell, but you also get these nice things. You might have already seen hints of it, the in and out prompts that you can then refer back to. Um, you can also get shell integration, so you can actually call shell commands, such as cd, ls, cat, things like that. You get uh, introspection. So uh, Josh and others have already shown you how to do a question mark, how to do tab completion on your namespace. You also get non-blocking plotting. So if you just uh, invoke matplotlib from the Python interpreter itself, you will get a plot that comes up. Um, and it won't close and you don't get sort of execution of your program back until you close that window. And what IPython gives you is that when you pull up a plot, it gives you back the prompt. It gives you back the, uh, you know, the in prompt, so you can keep typing other things in that plot, but that, that uh, figure that popped out just sort of stays popped out. You don't get that for free in just using plain old Python. So if you, write, if you end up writing just plain old Python program, be aware of that, that's something, that's one limitation that you would have not using IPython. And if, if you don't remember any anything from this talk at all, uh, just remember quick ref. So that we have these magic commands in IPython. That's one of the things that, that's the extensibility uh, that uh, IPython, the interactive Python shell, gives you to just the plain old Python shell. We call them magic commands. They usually start with a percent sign. Um, there are ways of 
invoking them without using the percent sign. So sometimes you can use them interchangeably depending on your, your settings. But basically, the percent quick ref thing is the thing is the go-to thing that where most of the things that I'll cover, cover today are in there or at least hinted at. And then you can look at the individual help for each individual command to figure out what that is. But the quick ref is like, you know, there are things in the quick ref that I don't memorize, but I end up, I know that it's there, so I can always look it up. And uh, as of the latest IPython release, the quick ref actually includes all of the possible magic commands. That didn't used to be the case. Uh, I think that may, might not be the case with uh, 12.1, which you got with EPD, but if, you ha if you're running uh, IPython 013, you'll get that. Okay, so let me, let's go over uh, this tutorial. So, okay, so, so we have here a pair, and a lot of these things that are things that you've already seen, but I've just written this so that you can rerun it afterward and know exactly what happened, but I'll just step you through it just so, so uh, we know what's going on. So the first thing, I did, well first, the, the sort of the, the candy is that I embedded that YouTube video using two lines of code inside of an IPython notebook, right? So you can imagine how cool that is for writing little tutorials or documentation for your, for your project, things like that, um, even class assignments. So pedagogical, uh, pedagogically, it's, it's a very nice tool to have. So this parrot um, is dead, it's a string. Um, these uh, um, so parrot is now an object, right? So I can do parrot dot tab, and it'll give me the the methods that parrot can do, right? So I can I can sort of uh, after that. So say I select upper, then if I do a question mark, what pops up is the documentation for the method upper of the string object. Oh yeah, I should say that one of the reasons that I didn't do slides and I just did the text thing is because it just seemed like a shame to do an, a talk on the IPython, interactive Python prompt without having you guys code along. So if you, uh, um, you can also, the, the things that I'm doing here, you can also just do without a notebook. You, you don't, uh, you can, well, it's small enough you can type it out and you can just do it in just a plain old terminal. There's not, nothing except for the YouTube video in here is specific to the notebook interface. Okay, so so the, then what, what does the upper method do? Well, it capitalizes that, so the parrot is dead. So then what you can also do, so the question, the one single question mark gets you the documentation of a given module or function or attribute. What happens when you do a double question mark, so I'm gonna import os.path, is that you actually get the full code of the module, if it's a pure Python thing. If it's a C extension, if, 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 first of all, none of that makes, uh, none of what I'm about to say makes sense to you, don't worry about it, but if it's just a pure Python file and IPython has a way of getting to it, it'll, it'll put it in here. So you, you know, some people say, you know, the best documentation is the code, and it certainly helps that if whatever is documented doesn't actually work the way that it's advertised to just look at the code. So the double question mark gets you there. And you will need this for the breakout, so um, that's a useful tip. Okay, and so uh, what What if you want to know um, what things in my namespace have the, the, the string uh, pi in it? And with the string pi, uh, let me do this. All right, so so I just, I just uh, uh, call the magic uh, for pylab. PyLab is the thing that allows me to do matplotlib uh, plotting inline so that the images get generated and placed inside the web browser as opposed to popping up as figures. And it also imports things into the namespace. I think Josh uh, alluded to this earlier. And so now I want to know what in my namespace ends with the word pi. And so this is the, the sort of incantation that you would do is sort of star pi question mark. What are all the things that end with pi? And so there's a copy, an entropy, numpy, and spy methods that got imported that are in my namespace right now. And then similarly, so for this wildcard sort of lookup, um, what has pi anywhere in it, it's a lot more things like copyright and 
fast copy and transpose, things like that. So this is, this is when you know, you suspect what the name of some function might be, particularly if you're doing exploration and you've done an import, import star from some module, you might, uh, this w would be one way of exploring that and trying to find out what the different things in there, when you know a partial name or, or sort of different ways of calling it. So the peasant is going to be, I'm not dead yet, and uh, now I'm going to just switch to, to dealing with these in and out things. So you see these, this in prompt is actually something that I can refer back to in the future, and same with the out prompt. So peasant is an object, it gets returned to this out thing, so at any point later on, if I want to, if I want to get back this out 15, that's all I have to do is I just type in out 15, and the peasant will be, I'm not dead yet, right? I can also um, do these, um, access the in prompt, the, sorry, I'm the, this a little scatterbrained, I apologize. Okay, so the, the, there's, there's, two, there's another way of accessing all of the out things, which is just underscore then the number. So underscore 15 will be the same thing as just uh, 15, and so if I go back up here, if I had something else, so out six, right, that should be dead, so let's check that. That is dead, and, and that's the same as out six. So it's just a, it's just a convention, except that the nice thing that you get is uh, underscore six now, I can do dot and tab and complete on it, right? That's a string, and so I can do, have all the methods on there. So this is when you're doing data analysis and you have some intermediate result, and you're not sure if you're gonna need it around, and it turns out, yes, I do need it now, and you, you sort of scroll up to see where it was and find its number and then pull it back in. This is also a, a common sort of source of people think of as memory leaks, because Python does keep around all these extra objects, uh, IPython rather, does keep around all these objects that get returned. So people might say, well, my program is, you know, the memory is growing, and what, what, my computer is becoming slow. Yes, question. How did you get that pull down? Uh, the pull, I pushed tab. So I, I did uh, underscore six, dot, and then I did tab. Thank you for the question. All right, so, um, so this is for the out prompts. The same thing uh, exists for the in prompts. You can do uh, sort of, so let's do in 20, and that will be the string that I typed in here. And, and so it's not, it doesn't get formatted, right? So there's a new line character in there, and the U is just the Unicode. You don't need to worry about that. But if I were to print it, that's, that's the thing that, that got typed in, okay? Um, and similarly, there's an underscore way of accessing these. You just prefound an underscore i, and then uh, you can do uh, 20. And so that's the same thing. Yes, question? I'm not seeing out of my notebook. I'm seeing the ends, but not the outs. Is there a setting or something? Are you executing the lines as you're going through? Yeah. Uh, so the, the one, one reason why an out prompt might not appear is if you end it with a, a semicolon. Is that the case? Are you, what, what's the command that you're typing out? Uh, you shift oh, that's right, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, sorry, uh, yeah. You shift enter, um, or uh, control, you can type things, and if you do control enter, it'll execute it and keep you at that same prompt. So you can do a print a one, enter, and then, you know, print two, and um, enter. Uh, control enter rather. Sorry, this has become such muscle memory. I'm sorry <laughs> that uh, sort of jumping around leap years ahead. Okay, I'll try to slow down and uh, actually make sense. Okay, so all, was already alluded to this who's uh, magic, which it tells you what the different things that you have defined in your namespace and uh, sort of some representation of, of those objects. And uh, there, whose is a magic, and there are many magics, and one magic that you might do is you, we want to reset the namespace. We want to get rid of all these things that, that we have lying around, and so this is uh, reset, 
And I, you have to pass it a minus F flag if it's invoked from the, um, from the notebook, because the notebook currently doesn't have a, a way of interacting in the, in the standard Python way. Uh, if you were to type in reset from a terminal IPython, then it would just prompt you, say, do you want to reset the whole namespace, yes or no? I can show that to you here. So, uh, so if A equals 10 and B equals uh, some string, uh, A, B, whose, it's there. If I do reset, it asks me, once deleted, variables will not be recovered. Do you want to proceed? You say yes. Uh, but what I'm doing from the notebook, because this prompt can't be answered in the notebook, so this is something to keep in mind. Notebooks will uh, uh, may block on you and just say sort of be frozen because, or it'll, it'll, it actually will report a thing that we can't access standard in or some message like that. Uh, this, this would be the reason. And reset F just doesn't ask, it's just force, right? And how I found that out is, again, reset, question mark, and just read the, the documentation. Okay, so then I, I said that there's ways of interacting with your system shell. You, you, the way to do that is by doing an exclamation mark. So bang I Python minus minus version is it'll actually go out and call that command on my machine, right? And so uh, just to show you that I'm not lying, you can do, uh, I don't know, this is just a file that's, that's on my file system and uh, I'm running the cat command on it, right? So, so you can just run arbitrary commands, you know, if you had some foobar program, you could do that. The nice thing, though, about uh, IPython is not only can you do this, but you can also get the results of running commands back into your Python shell and into your Python namespace. So let's do that here with, uh, I set the variable v to be equal to the result of, the, of running the command IPython minus version. And so that becomes a list of strings in this case, and there was only one line uh, output from this thing, so, so it gave me that. Uh, now if I do uh, a listing in my current directory, there's a bunch of files in here, right, that I'm, I'm running and I'm gonna be showing you guys. And so I can grab those files from the ls command, okay? So what is, what is the type of files? It's the special object called an slist, which is a list derivative that also has these extra attributes that return the results as a list, or as a string joined by new lines, or as a string joined by spaces, or if, since these are files, it's a list of path objects, Python, uh, IPython path objects. Yes? I want a Windows machine and the ls command was... Um... That's right, so that's, that's, so in your case it would be dir, is the thing that you, that's right, so that ls is a Unix specific command, so on Windows that would be dir or something like that, but um, yeah, thank you. Seems to work without it as well. Uh, that's right. So for so so there are some things that are common enough, like ls, that it also happens to be we make it as a magic or as an alias, so you don't have to put the bang out of, uh, in front of it. But some arbitrary command on your file system that that you wouldn't want to have a magic like a command called dd or something like that, or a command called man or whatever. Basically, an arbitrary command. If you put a bang in front of it, it'll get executed. Some commands already, the convenience commands like cd and uh, ls, we already created those for use because we use them frequently enough so that ls just also just works. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, and you, there is absolutely a way of, for you to extend what things you want alias to. So if there's some particular directory you always find yourself, you know, cd to, you know, cd thesis, and it's like some long set of things, you can alias that so that you could just, you know, have a command called thesis, and then it'll cd you to that directory, and maybe even you know run some files or something like that. Yeah. Yes. So can you show it not working without the bang? Can I show it not working with man? Without the bang. Oh, without the bang. Uh, yeah. So uh, if I were just type in IPython, it doesn't know that IPython is is a command because IPython is something that, that I execute in my terminal, right? IPython is like Chromium, right? I could, I could also, you know, I, I, could, I could type in here, you know, bang Firefox, and that will run the launch Firefox for me. Without it, it just, it tries to think of Firefox as an object, and it doesn't find it in the namespace. Okay, 
So, um, so this is again ls. So files. We did that. So the, here's here's the list of those files as a list, a, a list of strings. Then the 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 list of files joined by a space and uh, joined by new line characters, depending on how you want it. Um, so there's also a, absolutely a way of using something that's in your Python namespace and put it back inside a shell command, right? So this is sort of variable interpolation. So in this case, I uh, uh, just to remind you, I have this v thing that is uh, 0.12.1. Uh, and so the zeroth element, it's a list, right? So the zeroth element of v is a string, right? And I'm going to call the split method on it and split on the character uh, period. And so that, that will return back a list of these things. And so now what I'm going to do is for each of those things in this list, I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to print x just to let you guys know that it's there. And then I'm going to, I'm going to use, the, this isn't going to work on Windows again, but I'm going to use the Unix command touch that will just create a file uh, with the current timestamp with that name, right? So, and the way that I do that is x is something that, that's going to exist in, in the Python namespace but I'm gonna put it inside of the shell uh, uh, execution sort of context interpolated in there. So I'm gonna bang touch, and then the dollar sign X is the way that you get something from it. Because otherwise, if, if I just did touch X, it'll just create an X file, a file called X. But because I put in this dollar sign, it's gonna grab it, it's gonna try to grab it from the Python namespace and create a file that way, right? So this is why I said that some people actually use the IPython shell particularly on Windows, as a replacement for the system shell. Because you can do these sorts of things, and it's easier than doing sort of bash, um, bash scripting and things like that. So let's just uh, show how that works. And I'm going to ls again. And so now you see there's a, a file that got created that's 0, file that's 1, and file that's 12. Right? And I can also similarly do this again, just to remove those, uh, those uh, sort of extra files outside. And then they're not there. Okay. Again, I already said that uh, everything that's in here is also in Quick Ref. One nice uh, um, sort of uh, as a last uh, thing that I'm going to show you that's generic to across all of IPython is the the history magic. So the history magic shows you everything that you've done this session. But there are ways of specifying to the history magic that you want to go back a session or back two sessions. So by default, IPython just keeps storing the different sessions. So you might want to look at what you did, analysis you did sort of 10 days ago. There's, there's ways of doing that uh, with an IPython. And, and the way that you do that is that you read the documentation here, and then you, you grab some of these indentations. Okay. So as the last thing for, for this part, and I have about 10 minutes, is that right? Um, I'm gonna. I want to welcome you guys to the wonderful world of Python. Um, there is this Easter egg inside of Python. If you type in "import this," you'll get this nice little poem that you can uh, refer back to whenever you feel so inspired. Um, you will be using this in the breakout session as well. So, uh, and and the the one one weird neat thing about this is that if you try to import this again. Mysteriously, it doesn't, nothing happens. Okay? So I'll let, you, I'll let you figure that out once we get to it. Okay, so I've done this. Uh, one thing that I haven't shown you is how to do, um, how to run files and how to do some interactive debugging. So let me just quickly do that. So I'm here in a directory and I have one Python file that is called the uh, 01 underscore some file dot py. And the, the way that you just run it is you just use the run magic. So it happens to be that this is going to work for me. Uh, and that should have been an error. Oh, 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 of course, yeah, yeah. So I didn't, I didn't actually, so I'm sorry. So yeah, let me show you that it actually does something. So it's print, uh, hello class. Okay, so it's there. The reason that nothing happened is that I just have two functions defined in here, right? 
And so um, there was nothing for them to do. I never called one of them. I just defined some functions and uh, didn't call any of them, okay? But if I were to, uh, uh, to now include, so now we have hello class, and now let's, to the end of this event, I'm gonna call the, the, the function foo. Let's just take a look at what that, that's gonna do. Function foo, here's a stock string. It's gonna define an S, an A, and then for the B, it's gonna call the function B. When it does that, you'll see that it defines A as zero, and then it does a divide by zero, so that this is gonna be a bug in our code that's gonna blow up when we try to call it, okay? What that looks like in IPython, any questions there? That, that, that's clear? Sorry that I'm uh, sort of uh, jumping around. Let me do that. Okay, so now we're gonna uh, run some file again. And oh no, zero division error. And you'll see that unlike the plain old Python uh, terminal, uh, rather Python interpreter, which would have just given you the zero division error, it doesn't give you the tr stack trace. We give you the stack trace, and we give you these colors, right? And if you act now, we'll give you debugging. <laughs> so you just type in debug, and now I am, uh, where am I? So this is, in, this is the Python debugger. Uh, L is a command that allows me to give a listing of where I am in the file. So I see that I'm on line 15, so this is where the bug is. Uh, I see that ah, A is equal to zero, and but how did I get to bar, right? And so if you do U, you go up, uh, the stack call, so that, remember, how we, how we got here is that we first called foo here. So we entered into here. We went down, 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 executed these things. Then we called bar, went down, down, executed these things. This is where the bug happened. So now I can get back sort of the stack trace that has bar at the top. And then if I go up the stack, then I can get back to foo. And if I go up again, then I'll get back to the original line, right, line 18, where I called the, the, the foo command. The, the foo function. Okay, so, so that's debugging for you. And um, there's a way, I, uh, when I ran it here, it by default didn't invoke me into the debugger. There's a PDB magic that you can toggle on and off so that it automatically invokes the debugger when there's an error. So now if I run it, it'll go straight into the debugger. Right, and I, I know that because there's this IPDB prompt. It's no longer the you know in and out prompt that you used to see. Pretty cool, right? No, not so much. <laughs> not impressed. I worked hours for this. <laughs> um, okay, so um, let's see. I have ten minutes, and uh, what did I want to do? Okay, so so um, I, I already mentioned this PyLab mode. Um, so let let me just show you what this looks like in plain old Python. So this is just just sit back and and, and relax and. Uh, look at the screen. So Python, if I do import matplotlib.pyplot as plt, if I do plt plot range 10, plt show, this is what I was talking about, right? So this is this is a fine plot that, that's produced by matplotlib. I can pan it, I can move it around, things like that. But I don't, I can't type anything else here, right? And I can't do that until I close this. Then I get back the prompt. Okay. In IPython, it'll do the same thing until you invoke this uh, PyLab mode. So PyLab is this magic uh, sort of thing that imports some things into the namespace so that PLT prompt no longer needs to happen. What, what I did was, this is a convention that we have in our, in our community to usually we import matplotlib plotting this way. Uh, I didn't need to do this in this case. It was already imported for me by invoking that uh, pyplot magic. Uh, and now if I do plt plot range 10, you'll see that I get the out prompt back. So I can still interact with this with this thing, but I get this thing, uh, I get back the prompt and I can keep going and say a equals 10 and so on. Okay? Uh, I showed you debug. Uh, the time of magic, you'll go over in the, in the, in the breakout, you can see that. Um, there is doc test mode, so by default, Python documentation has things that, that sort of let you know that something is a Python prompt type of thing that you can type with this thing. Um, and by, by default, for a bad example, let me do two, we, we get rid of those. So if you go into the Python documentation that's 
live online on the web, and you copy paste something that has these caret prompts out in front of it, we'll, we actually strip them out for you when you paste them in. So that's nice. But if you really, if you want to write your documentation in such a way, you just do this uh, doc test, uh, doc test mode thing, and now you have the same thing. So you just get rid of these in and out things, and now I'll be able to copy paste things as I'm doing and uh, paste them into my documentation. So that's, that's a nice way of documenting your project in, in sort of a, in a standard way. Okay, uh, there is a paste magic, which sometimes it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a pain in the butt to copy paste long things of, uh, uh, around. And so, uh, let me turn off the doc test mode. Uh, so there's this paste magic that actually allows you to, to paste things in from, so this might be something that I copy and then I paste it and it's not gonna work, of course, because I just copy pasted some random junk that isn't Python. Um, okay, and so I, I just have a couple of uh, minutes that, mm, I hesitate to do this. Okay, so just quickly, okay, so, so what I told you is everything that works in IPython. There is this thing, let me just show you what the organization is like. So the, there's the, an IPython kernel that can um, talk to and interact with multiple clients. One such client is the console. So everything that I'm, I'm writing on here is you just put IPython in front of it. There's Qt console, and then there's the notebook. Okay, so so the way the way this works is that you can you can start up go here uh, up over view. Okay, so the IPython kernel is the computational workhorse. It just allows you to start up its one sort of instance running instance that you can then connect to. The Qt console and the console is a way of connecting to that uh, to that kernel. And the way that works, so let me show you here. So I'm going to start up an IPython kernel here, and it gives me this string that to connect another client to this kernel, use this string, okay? And uh, if it's the last one that you launch, actually just existing is enough, okay? So now I'm gonna t type in IPython Qt console minus minus existing, and now I, I'm sort of live inside of this <coughs> kernel that I started up, okay? So this is A equals 10, a equals hello, okay, so that's one thing that I've done, right? So that's, I connected one client to it. I can also do, connect it in the terminal. So this is a Qt console, this is a Qt application, it has pull down menus, this isn't a regular terminal. In particular, if you type in a PyLab inline mode, then you can do, in here you, you get actually inline things, right? And you can also have a tabbed interface where I just started up a new kernel and a new kernel, and so just like a web browser. Okay. Uh, I can also do console existing, and this gets me to the the the, the this last pro kernel that I started up now has a equals thirty. So sorry if I'm jumping around. See, I defined it in here from this client, but you can see it in here from this client. The reason that this is important to know is that of the three, the notebook is one that you can't really do interactive debugging in, but the notebook, when you start up, a, when you open up a particular notebook, what it does is actually launches a kernel that if it's running locally or if you know how to connect to it, you can connect to it using these other things that can do debugging, okay? So you can, you can actually, when you, start up, uh, when you start up a notebook, so let me show you that. So this is a notebook that's running, there's a connect, Time? Yeah. Uh, there's a, when you don't mistype it, there's a connect info, connect info magic that actually gives you this information of how to connect to the kernel that this notebook is looking down on. So then you can use the Qt console or the console to connect up to it. So this is something that's very hard to find a concise uh, description of in the documentation. So I thought I'd give you this to let you know what's actually going on so that you understand what it means to, to have an IPython notebook running, how you can actually connect to it from, from the terminal or from a Qt console and interact with it uh, in a different manner. Okay?
running out of time. Um, and I'll be around for the next three days. Uh, so if, if none of this made sense to you, or if only very little did, I'd be happy to tell you. So uh, this, this you can look up. Uh, again, one thing from the notebook, if you take away nothing else, is how to get the, uh, uh, the help for the shortcuts to come up. And that's just Control M, and then you press H. So Control M, H, Control M, H. So that's, that gives you all the, the other things that I would have described here. And now we have uh, ways of uh, viewing. So these notebook files, these .ipynb containers, actually have code. They have markdown, as, as you see, right? So this is, this is sort of a description that I did. Here I had a heading. And here I'm including a URL to my website. Um, so that's markdown. Then there's code. And it also keeps around the images. So when you save a .ipynd file, it saves the complete state of your notebook at that time. So if somebody else opens it up on another, on another computer, or if you use our new notebook viewer interface and you put it out somewhere on the web, you'll be able to see everything that was done sort of nicely formatted without having to run anything. Right? So that's, it's a way of like capturing state of your, of your progress of your research, whatever it is that you're working on. But we're linking to that uh, view of all the notebooks Great. Okay. Um, so um, I could go over the. Uh, I was going to intending to go over the notebook uh, notebooks that I included, but those are. I feel those are pretty self-explanatory. You guys can uh, can play with those on your own. And um, I just want to welcome you to the uh, Scientific Python community. Uh, I think it's great to have this many this many new users. It's very exciting. Uh, we work very hard on these tools, as you will find yourself working very hard on them because it's a lot of fun. Uh, it's better than writing your thesis in a lot of cases. <laughs> IPython, uh, just as an anecdote, because Fernando's not here, IPython started as Fernando Perez's thesis procrastination project. So, um, and uh, it's, 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 you know, you're gonna be following a long tradition of you know, graduate students procrastinating on their thesis if you uh, choose to work on these tools and contribute. There's a lot more of past presentations, videos, documentation, how to, how to subscribe to the mailing list to uh, connect to the IPython community, users of IPython. And uh, just to let you know, uh, uh, the way that our communities work is we sort of have overlapping but separate communities and that there's a separate mailing list for IPython there's a separate mailing list for Matplotlib. There's a separate mailing list for NumPy. But they're so, all sort of they all sort of interact, and you don't have to subscribe to all of them. But when you have a question, just try to direct yourself to the thing that makes the most sense for which tool you're having trouble with, and do ask questions because we we actively sort of support this because you know it makes our work last longer when there are, when there are actual users. Um, so yeah, take a look at the uh, breakout uh, notebook that got posted. I think. Um, and let me just show you what that looks like. Any no, questions? I didn't post, no, I didn't post the breakout. Yeah. Okay. So let me just show you. Okay. Uh, so this is the IPython notebook viewer. And what you can do here is you can paste the URL of some notebook that lives somewhere. And in this case, let me just uh, grab the raw version of the notebook that I checked in. There's a link to that. Okay. Okay. So, so here's the, the 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 breakout sessions that I wanted you to do. I wanted you to decode the secret message. Um, you, I want you to run the timing, uh, time it magic to see which is faster, range or X range, and then uh, to do you know range question mark and X range question mark to read the dots for why one is faster than the other. Uh, and then you can also, uh, if you're feeling adventurous, you can uh, dive into the configuration options for uh, IPython. You, you might have noticed that when I uh, start up my uh, IPython, I get this little thing, and that's probably not what you get. This is just a motivational thing that I've put in for myself. Um, but uh, you can sort of do this customization and add extra things. And uh, I think the example here that I included is how to make tab completion automatically show you all the underscore and double underscore things, um, which is the which used to be the way that that tab completion worked, and we find that usually those things are hidden away for a reason. So now we make you explicitly put in the underscore, but you can revert that behavior. So these are all sort of tools that that 
you can make your own and um, yeah, have fun. Happy hacking. Oh, a uh, commit is, uh, so we use version control, and so a commit is a patch to, so there's current state of IPython, the project, and I go in and I say, I want to make feature foo, right? And so feature foo ends up being a patch, a difference between what IPython looks like today and what my IPython looks like with the feature foo. And that, then when I, I make that commit, and then I make a pull request for IPython to, hey guys, take a look at this cool new feature, here's what the code is, here's what it does, and when that gets accepted in, then my, I, that means that I have a commit inside IPython. So there's a commit history for all these projects. And so you can go through and see uh, who's made how many commits. So I can, I can show you, um, in fact, the, the way that I did this. Um, so git short log. Uh, so git is the version control system. I think we'll, go, we'll be going over this. But you can see that Fernando Perez has by far the most, so now I'm just numbering how many commits were made. <coughs> Fernando Perez has by far the most commits to IPython. And then there's a graduate student here at Berkeley, uh, Min Reagan Kelly, that has the second most. Brian Granger, another core uh, contributor to IPython, professor at uh, Cal Poly, and a, a graduate student friend of Fernando Perez's has the next, and so, and so on. I'm somewhere, there I am. So I'm on, I'm on the map. Um, so yeah, so that's what a commit is. Any other questions? Cool, so have fun with the breakout. Or, or not? Are we? Are they doing a breakup? Are we moving yeah, on? Do, uh, ten minutes. Yeah, it's about a ten minute. All right. Why don't we get started with the next session? We're running a little bit behind. We don't want to keep you guys here too long. We've been here since pretty early. Uh, so we're not going to go over all of the solutions to the breakout session that Paul just gave. Uh, we will post those online. Uh, if you have any questions, we'll be sticking around afterwards. Feel free to grab us, uh, bother us about some of these things. Uh, now I'm going. My name's Brad, by the way. I don't think I've met most of you. I'm going to talk about, uh, for the first time, we're going to do some actual, real, uh, substantive, uh, at least the infrastructure you need to do real, substantive mathematical uh, calculations. I think a lot of people here are coming from the physical sciences. Uh, social sciences, people who are dealing with reasonably large data sets. So the, the idea behind this session is to give you an introduction to some of the Python packages that you will need to handle uh, large amounts of data. Uh, the two packages are called NumPy, and then to actually plot that data called matplotlib. Uh, if you're on the agenda website, there are a couple different ways you can follow along. I know some people uh, had questions about how to get the notebook started, all that stuff. Uh, right there is a link to the PDF of the lecture slides that I'm going to give, so you can download that and follow along. Uh, I also made a notebook with most of the code that's going to be on my slides. You can grab the PDF version, uh, you can grab the raw version and enter it in, um, in the notebook itself. We'll show you how to do that in a second. If you just click on the, uh, the HTML viewer, it renders it in HTML. So you can't actually click on any of these cells. It won't do anything, but you can see uh, what's going on. And if you download the raw notebook and save it within the extension uh, IPMYB, uh, we can fire that up. Just again, start up the notebook, iNotebook, IPython notebook. I'm going to add uh, two flags here because I'll be stepping through some of this. The PyLab. Uh, loads a bunch of NumPy and matplotlib packages that are useful, and inline uh, argument tells it to sh put the plots uh, in line. I'll show you what that means in just a second. Uh, but how to load this up, right? We fire up the notebook. It says it's launching. It shows us here something in our browser. We have a single uh, IPython notebook that's in that directory. It already knows where to look. We fire that up. Just click on it. And in a second, it'll have the full notebook here. So you can step through, and almost all, there are a couple changes I made at the last minute, but uh, almost all the code that I'm going to be showing in the slides is in this notebook. So instead of you guys having to type it, you can step through and see uh, what it looks like there. 
Yes, question. Sorry, go ahead. Can you show the code again? To start up the notebook? Mm -hmm. It's this line right here. So you call IPython, you, and you add the notebook argument to it. That should start up a new window in a web browser if you have a web browser open. Well, what additional functionalities are you adding by doing the PyLab and the inline? I will show you as we get towards the end of the lecture. If I don't, remind me at the end. Yes? Can we open up the, the specific uh, .py or Right, so let me, I'll do this one more time to show you uh, what happens. Let's kill these. Okay, so I have a single uh, IPYNB file in this directory called numpy plus matplotlib. I just grabbed it off the website. I type ipolython notebook, a couple extra flags here, get it up and running, enter. It automatically takes me, once it gets the kernel up and running, over to my web browser. It starts the notebook and lists all of these .ipnyb files that it finds in the directory that you started IPython in. In this case, there's only one. I go over there, you can see I have a hand now when I select it. I click on it, and it loads that notebook up. Okay? Okay. So, here we are. Uh, again, you know, NumPy, the, uh, which provides you with a capability that we're gonna call an array, and matplotlib plotting. Uh, the reason why most of you, uh, we, think, we think most of you are scientists, uh, we hope that you know if you ever get an Excel spreadsheet from someone, you maybe think, ooh, I don't know if this person really knows uh, what they're doing. Uh, but if you send them a notebook or a Python file or something like that, you'll seem very impressive even if your work is not. Um, <laughs> that's how I've gotten by so far. Uh, array creation and basic operations. I'm going to introduce you to this idea of what a universal function is in broadcasting. They're very powerful tools in Python, but it operates somewhat different from the rest of the things that we've seen so far today. Some basic compar comparison testing, uh, selection, and manipulation of arrays. Uh, the NumPy module provides some basic statistics capabilities. You'll get a lot more uh, in SciPy, which we'll talk about, uh, I believe, tomorrow on Wednesday. And then how to make some basic plots. You know, you want to put nice, pretty things in your paper. Uh, the array class. We're going to talk about object-oriented programming. But essentially what NumPy provides is access to this thing called an ND array, okay? And the ND array is exactly what you think it is. It's an object, okay? It, it, it represents a multi-dimensional, in the same way that a list is, it can have any number of dimensions, sorry, not in the same way that a list is. It can have any number of dimensions, uh, but what's very important is that all of the items in this array are homogenous. Okay, they're a fixed size and a fixed type. And changing that uh, makes a big difference, right? So you can imagine, let's say I have a list. We saw before, you can have a list. The list can be composed of integers, strings, other lists, whatever you want. Python doesn't care. It doesn't really matter, okay? But when you're specifying an array at the outset, you're going to tell it what the individual items, the constituents of this array, what they look like. They need to be a fixed size, fixed type, uh, because some of the operations we're going to perform on the array uh, take advantage of that fact. I'll come back to that in a second. I think it's pretty easy just to learn from looking at a few examples. How do I create one of these NumPy arrays, these ND arrays? You're never going to really call the ND array uh, method itself. Usually it, it comes from other methods that will return you an array. So to get started, we import the NumPy package. It's traditional to call that uh, as NP, just to save us a few letters when we're typing. Uh, one of the questions we heard earlier is what is the PyLab flag? When I started IPython earlier, uh, it loads, it does this uh, to start off with. This is one of the things it loads into your namespace. And we can start with our very simple first array. A equals NP.array has three items, one, two, and three. Go here a little bit. I can print that, show you what kind of representation it has. Not surprising, very basic array. Uh, the ones method or function will give you an array where every item is a one. 
Uh, if you pass an argument to it, a single tuple, that will uh, change the size of the array that it returns. So this will return you set to be an array that has uh, three rows or two columns or three items in the first dimension and two in the second dimension. Okay, if you want to think about uh, multi-dimensional items. Is each uh, array, ND array, has a property called its shape. It's a tuple that tells you, uh, describes how the geometry of the array. Uh, zeros, like ones, returns an array that instead is populated by zeros. If you pass two arguments to something that generates an array like this, the second one will specify the type of the, uh, of the uh, things that are in your array. So in this case, it's a one by three uh, array with all integer zero values. If I look at the type of C, it's an ND array. That's what I said it was before. But if I look at the D type, Okay, this is a property of the ND array, again, in the same way that shape is. That specifies that all of the individual items are 64-bit integers. Okay? Uh, lin space, someone was asking before, you know, is there a way to create uh, arrays with not, this one, in this case, it's actually fixed the spacing. Uh, but this will generate an array. It will go from one up to five, again, not inclusive on the five, and there will be 11 points in between there. There's a corresponding, if you want, logarithmically spaced arrays, uh, np.log space, we'll do that. Oh, sorry, one to five uh, inclusive in this case, and 11 points uh, in between there is what the lin space method does. Um, so I was saying about types before, why it's important that all these things have the same fixed type. So if I create an array and I give it three items, I give it one, two, and 3.0, it's going to create an array and it's going to use the sort of smallest representation that it can that will accommodate all of the things that you feed it in there. So here you have an int, an int, and a float. Uh, the float is larger than the int, so it will use the float when you initially create the array and it will send cast everything in this array to a float. So all of the items are going to be of type uh, float in this case. Uh, if I send it uh, integer one, integer two, and string three, uh, the smallest thing that will accommodate those is actually a bit surprising. It's a one character string, okay? So it casts everything now as a one character string, S1, that's what the D type is telling you about. If I try instead to set the last item of this array to something that's not a one character string, strange things are hap going to happen that you're probably not going to like. In this case, it's going to just cut off everything there and use the first character of this as a string. Okay, so unlike everything else in Python, where there's a lot of freedom and flexibility in defining the types of variables that are stored in, in your, uh, in your uh, variables, uh, it's very important that you pay careful attention to what types of things you're setting in this. Uh, here's one more example. If I have three integers, if I try to set the first one to 1.5, it's going to just uh, treat that as a single integer one. If I try to change the D type of this array to a float now, that's really going to throw it off because it's set aside certain parts of memory. Uh, if I then try and read C, it's going to give me something nonsensical back because it's actually reading into memory that it sort of didn't allocate initially when the sizes of these things was quite small. Okay, so be careful about, um, so yeah, I guess this is a, another meme for Josh here. Uh, Honey Badger doesn't use the NumPy arrays because uh, NumPy arrays actually care about the type of things that you're putting in there, and he doesn't care about that. Um, okay, yes, of course. Go ahead, ask your question. I'll, I'll bring it up here in just a second. Yep. Uh, this uh, array is storing these three things as integers. Okay? So I'm saying I want the first item in this array to be an integer. It's just hacking off everything that comes after the integer part of that number and setting it to one. 
I'm, I'm saying I want C of zero to be 1.5, and it's saying this, these, all the things in this are integers. I can't store 1.5 there. OK, uh, you can also uh, read arrays from files. This is something that you'll be doing, hopefully, from your homework. Uh, I have a, a small file. You don't need to download it, but you can just read it. It has two lines with the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, data.txt there. The load text uh, method will just read this into an array. And you can see here it's in a 2 by 2 array, where it reads them, in this case, uh, as floats. Uh, it also allows you to write out to files. If you just said to file uh, your array, it will write it out in binary format. Uh, you can also tell you if you want it to write out, in this case, as floats with a comma separation between all the individual items. So then if I go back and look at, I call this data.out1, it tells me it's a binary file. It's not really much interesting to see. But if I look at the second one, there are actually the numbers from my array. Uh, I changed them. It should be a one um, uh, with comma separated variables. There are lots of uh, things that will allow you to read uh, comma separated variables, FITS files if you're an astronomer, even pixel values from JPEG. Uh, these are all provided in various uh, NumPy and also matplotlib modules for you to read in data. Uh, arrays uh, do work like lists in that you can index and slice over them in the same way that you can do with lists. So you can imagine the uh, A range creates uh, an array with uh, items in the same way that range and X range do for lists. Uh, so now I have uh, a 10, uh, 10 item array running from 0 to 9. If I want to grab the second one there, uh, that's number 2. If I want to grab from 2 to 5, if you remember how sort of strings were indexed uh, or lists were indexed in that way from 0 uh, out to n. That will return me a subarray of some of these <laughs> items. Uh, in addition to two things, I can say I want to take A from the beginning to item number six in steps of two and set that equal to minus 1,000. So that will change A so that A sub zero, A sub two, A sub four have all now been replaced. Okay, so the syntax for this is starting uh, point, ending point, and uh, increment between those. Uh, your increments can be negative. So if you want to reverse an array simply, you can just say from start to end where my increment is minus one. It'll spit it back out in reverse order. Uh, and you can also uh, wrap around arrays nicely. That's not necessarily capable uh, in some of these other things. So, oh no, sorry, not wrap around. Uh, if I want to go, say, from, if I don't know how big my array is to start off with, but I say I want to start from two to two from the end and only grab the middle ones, uh, that will work. Yeah. Yes? Yes, so you, there's uh, most of the, like, the load CSV or load text will have an optional flag called skip lines, yeah. or there's also like a, a comment line, so you know, a lot of lines have uh, count signs in front of them. Uh, those are options that you can pass to them as, as well. All right, uh, structured arrays. So everything that I've shown you so far has been pretty simple and then the D type has been an int or a float or something uh, singular like that. But it's actually, uh, you can put together very complex uh, data types into each of your individual items in, array, in an array. It need not be that straightforward. Uh, these are generally called uh, structured arrays, and you can specify that with the D type. So in this case, I want to create an array that has uh, this size where my data type, where each individual element uh, is going to be zero, but all the zeros are going to be represented slightly differently. So I'm going to have a 4-bit integer, a 4-bit floating point number, and a 10-character string. Okay? So what does that look like? Uh, what does 0 look like in those different formats? Uh, 0 integer, 0 floating point. Uh, 0 as a 10-character string is actually just an empty string um, in this, for this representation. 
And it also returns this D type, which tells me that the first item, uh, the first uh, object in each uh, uh, array item is named F0, and this is its type, I4, again, a four-bit integer. The second one is F1 with this type, and the third one is F2. So for a structured array, there's a very nice way that you can access all the individual uh, columns, if you will. If I just say X sub F1, it's going to give me all of the things that fall in F1, in this case, all of the um, uh, floating point representations of zero, and it returns them with a floating point data type. And I don't think we've talked about um, copying and referencing too much, but something you want to be very careful about, if we assign Y to be X sub F1, uh, these zeros here, we're actually uh, pointing Y to that uh, memory space. So if we then change Y, in this case, we add to it another array with one, uh, that will change X as well. Okay, this is something subtle. We'll get, I think we'll talk about it more tomorrow, uh, copying, referencing, uh, and how deep um, your assignments are. Uh, but this is something you want to be careful about. Yes? What does the F stand for? Uh, this is, it's just a default, like, uh, F, I, I don't, I'm not sure what the F, okay. like, Y, F as opposed to J, K, or whatever. Um, but, you know, it's just telling you this is row zero, this is, or column zero, this is column one. Uh, and you will use this in your homework for today. So, uh, this will, this will make your homework today much easier to use this. Uh, universal function. You, the reason why, uh, the, the definitions of NumPy arrays are so strict is precisely for this. Uh, there are a number of very basic functions. Most of them are simple things, uh, mathematical operations, but they can be, in fact, much more, more complex that will operate on an, uh, on an array on an element-by-element -element basis, okay? And the reason why uh, the arrays are defined the way they are is because this uh, can be done very quickly if uh, on sort of under the hood if NumPy knows how big these things are. So a universal function, really all you need to know without delving in too much of the details, is that these operate on an element by element basis on arrays, okay? So let's get some examples. Suppose I have two arrays, both of them are two by two. Uh, a is one, two, three, four, B is two, three, four, five. If I add them, okay, adding in this case is known as the universal function because it works on an element by element. So it adds each of the corresponding elements and puts the output in a new array in that element spot. Okay? That makes perfect sense for adding. It doesn't make quite as much sense for multiplication necessarily, but in fact this is how the multiply routine works. Okay, again, it works on an element by element basis, it's taking one times two, setting it to two, two times three, setting it to six, etc. It's not matrix multiplication. Okay? Multiply is a universal function, and it's operating element by element. Uh, power, same way. If you want uh, more matrix linear algebra type operations, those are also capable within Python. There's the dot or inner product. Uh, there's also a linear algebra package that will uh, provide those. Uh, universal functions run uh, much, much faster than just simply looping over all the individual items in an array. Here's a, an example of that. Uh, suppose I have an array A, which is just composed of 500 by 500 random numbers uh, between 0 and 1. Uh, B is the same thing. And I want to look at two different ways to multiply the, them together on an element by element basis. I can use the universal function, where I just return a times b. Or I can use the uh, for loop way, where I create a new array, set it to empty, has the same shape as a to start. Uh, I iterate over all the uh, items in one dimension. I iterate over all the items in the other dimension and I set the output equal to the product of the two. Okay, that's basically, you know, element by element what multiplication is doing. 
But if I use this time it, this is one of these magic functions within IPython. If you just type this in as a Python interpreter, uh, it won't work. But if you do this within IPython, it will. Uh, the first thing takes about two microseconds, uh, milliseconds, excuse me, on average. Whereas the second one is over a factor of a factor of 100 slower. Okay, so if you're actually working with large data sets, you know, if you have really small things, it doesn't matter. You can have for loops, but if you're working with reasonable sized data sets, you should never be iterating over a for loop uh, to get at all the items in the array. It's a very bad practice, at least for very slow code. Uh, it's sort of frowned upon. Uh, there's another idea, I'll just introduce this to you briefly, it's called broadcasting. I told you that it was very important that arrays be defined in a specific manner. Uh, that's true, but there is some, a bit of flexibility when you're dealing with universal functions. Suppose I have some array that has one, two, three, because three is a floating point number, all of these are going to be cast to floats, and I add two to that. Okay, if you tried to do that in C, if you tried to do that in IDL, it wouldn't work very well because these are different sizes. But the universal function broadcasts this integer if it can do that in a sensible way to give you some result. And you can imagine, just naively, if I said I wanted to add two to this, I probably want to add two on an element by element basis. And that's what it'll do. And this is the idea behind broadcasting. Okay, you can add uh, arrays of different sizes as long as their sizes are reasonably compatible. If they're not, okay, if I want to multiply something that is uh, three by one to something that's four by one, that doesn't necessarily have any obvious way to do that. Okay, and in that case, it will throw an exception. Uh, you need to be careful when doing this, however, sometimes it will do some things that are not exactly obvious. There's a very well-defined set of rules so it will be repeatable, but they're not all necessarily obvious in the way that it does that. So imagine if I have an array that's instead of a three by one, one by three, uh, and then I multiply them together. That will actually not throw an exception, but will instead multiply one by this row, two by that row, and then three by that row. That's just something to, to be careful with if you're actually dealing with arrays of different sizes. Uh, there are some very nice and quick ways to do comparison testing and selection. Uh, throw a couple of new arrays in here, 130, 032. Uh, again, on an element by element basis, I want to know if A is greater than B. Uh, it does that as a universal function. It returns true, yes, false, false. Uh, A equals B, same things here. And you can also assign that output uh, to a new array. In this case, it's an array. The d-type, again, for all of these is boolean. Uh, there are logical ands. In this case, a is greater than 0 and a is less than 3. It will check, again, on an element by element. It'll say, OK, a is greater than 0. It's less than 3, yes. First one's going to be true. Greater than 0, yes. Less than 3, no. Greater than 0, no. So the output is true, false, false. Logical ors as well work in the same way. Uh, what I use the most, and I think uh, you guys, if you deal with large arrays, will probably use it the most as well, is what's called the uh, WHERE uh, method. So the WHERE method operates in the following manner. Suppose I have some array here, it has five items, and I say WHERE A does not equal zero. The first argument to WHERE needs to be some sort of conditional test. If you only send one argument to it, it will return an array of indices where that conditional is met. Okay, that's not extremely intuitive, but uh, this is how it works. So what it'll do is it'll go through the individual uh, elements within A. It will say A is not equal zero. The zeroth one, yes, that's true. So it will return zero index. The first one, yes, that's true. The first index. The second one, no, it's not. So it won't return anything there. The third one, yes. The fourth one, no. Okay? So because it matches in three times, it returns a, a three element array um, back to you. You can do something, if you want to actually extract the uh, items in that uh, 
uh, array where that is true. You can do that with this sort of same syntax as you would use with lists. And instead of giving you the indices where that condition is met, it actually gives you the items where that is met. Uh, but what's really nice with where is instead of just providing a conditional statement, you can also say, if this is true, I want you to return this first thing. Or if it's false, I want you to return this second thing. Okay? So where needs to have either one or three arguments to it. So in this case, it'll look at A, and if A is not, the individual elements are not zero, it will take the inverse of them. Otherwise, it will return the element itself, which is zero by construction. Okay? And again, just to show you how, uh, where does uh, indices if you have a multi-dimensional array. So I want to know which uh, elements are greater than five. Uh, it will return a two-dimensional array because the two-dimensional array was input, where in this case we're looking at uh, row number two, zero, one, two, position zero, that's the first one, row number two, position one, row number two, position two, all the items where it's greater than five. So a way to efficiently extract information and do basic comparison tests from your array. Okay, there is the capability within NumPy to do very basic statistics. Uh, an array, as I said before, is an object. If you haven't done object-oriented programming, you'll know sort of what that means uh, after Joey uh, talks about it tomorrow. Uh, for these purposes, essentially, you can take uh, the mean of it very simply. Uh, it, for a two-dimensional array, it's not exactly obvious what the mean means, uh, but it just takes it by all elements you can tell it to look over a specific axis if you want. Uh, two different ones will give you, obviously, different responses. You can take the standard deviation of your array, again, an element by element basis. In this case, we're calculating the average where we're inputting in uh, the array range, the list of range there, and we're giving it some weights to work with. Uh, there's the random um, module, which I talked about briefly before. Uh, if I random.rand gives me a random uh, five element array with random numbers uniformly distributed between zero and one, uh, rand int gives me a random integer between five and ten, uh, greater than or equal to five, less than ten. And you can also do a few basic uh, well defined distribution the normal distribution, the Poisson distribution. So this samples something on the normal distribution where the mean is 1.5 and the uh, sigma is 4.0. If you want more complicated distributions, these are all in the SciPy package. Yes, the question. Um, and maybe you're going to cover this, but how do you point to a large data How do I point it? Like if I want to read in a file or something like that. So the, there's the load text, if it's a text file. There's the load CSV, if it's like a comma separated variable file. Um, I can point you to a number of places where it'll show you how to read in different types of uh, input files that are either coming with the NumPy or the matplotlib package. But it, it, I mean, as we've been saying before, someone has built capabilities to read in almost any kind of file that you want. Okay, uh, matplotlib. Let's say we want to make some plots. I'm going to jump over to the notebook here uh, because I think it looks a little better uh, in that case. But it's also on my, it's the same thing uh, is on my slides. Uh, the other thing, as I said, that this pylab flag will do is it will import matplotlib.pylab as plt. This is the module or the package in which a lot of the basic um, plotting capabilities are installed. Uh, you'll also see this matplotlib.pyplot. There are a few subtle differences between what it, it's actually importing, uh, but for our purposes, uh, this is sort of identical to what Paul was showing earlier, um, import as plt. Uh, the basic uh, command you're going to use from this module is called plot. You can imagine I calculate some very simple uh, arrays here. Here I 
create one that has one, two, three. I use this universal function to square it. I plot x and y. And the third optional argument that I pass is something that tells me about how to actually put the points down there. Uh, if you've ever used MATLAB before, okay, this is very MATLAB-like syntax. The RO says I want red circles for my points. And if you remember before when I started IPython, I started it with the inline flag at the end. Basically all that means is that the plots will be showed in this notebook window instead of a new window popping up separately. Okay? So a very simple plot, as I said before, one, two, three, and the square of that from the x and the y axis. Uh, we can do some other very basic things. I create an array. Uh, where I want linearly spaced data between 0 and 2 pi, and I want 300 points between them. Uh, and then I want to take the sign of those, again, on an element by element basis, and plot that. You can see here, all I'm giving it is x and y. It automatically sets the scale. It automatically does the tick marks. In this case, it automatically shows the blue line for the color. All these things are customizable. I'll show you how to do a few of them. But it does a pretty reasonable job creating the plot to start out with. Um, this is a, a slightly more complicated example if you want to know how to change, say, the axis labels or the title of the plot. In this case, again, I'm taking the sign and uh, I have the sign of x, y, I have the sign of x squared is y2. Uh, I can plot x and y, and this label will create a label for the legend, and you can see if any of you have ever written in LaTeX before, if I pass it a raw string with some LaTeX math syntax, it will actually properly uh, read that and format it as such. Uh, same thing here. This allows me to change the title. This changes, not surprisingly, the label on the x-axis, the label on the y-axis, create an evenly spaced grid and give me a legend. And this is the result of the output of that. Okay? Um, there, what I've shown you here is sort of the very simplest way to interact with the plot command. It's what we'll call like the non-object oriented way uh, because we haven't covered object oriented programming. There's a much more powerful way where uh, matplotlib is actually returning you like a plot or an axis object. Um, that gives you basically a much richer syntax to work with. But since this was just an introduction, uh, I didn't want to confuse anything too much. But if you have more questions about that, uh, just let us know uh, at the end. Uh, a couple more really basic capabilities that are in NumPy, NumPy and Matplotlib combined. You can do some very simple uh, polynomial least squares fitting. Suppose I have two arrays, and I want to first fit a uh, so I have x and y, which are you know simple arrays. Uh, there is this poly fit to which I send it the x, the y, and the order of the fit. And that returns what's called like a, a polynomial structure. It doesn't actually return the values of the fit. You need to then give it a grid on which to evaluate that. So then I take uh, the one-dimensional polynomial and put it on to p. I can do the same thing with a slightly higher order fit, call that P30. Uh, and on here, uh, I'm actually creating the grid on which I want to evaluate these polynomials, and I will plot them. And this changes the stretch uh, on the y axis, the, the limits uh, over which this is plotted. So you can see here's my original data shown as these blue points. The green is a third order polynomial fit to them. The red dashed line is a 30 order fit, which does a better line going. It's obviously a better job going through the points, but also introduces uh, some very funny behavior there. Not surprisingly, it gives you a warning that you're using a much higher uh, order polynomial than you uh, are probably justified in doing. Uh, and I think the last thing that I want to show is there's a nice histogram plotting method uh, and a random number generator. So I can create a normal distribution in the random uh, module with the normal method. I give it a mean, a sigma, and a number of points that I want to generate. I can then very nicely just plot that 
as a histogram. Uh, it stretches over a bit uh, here at this resolution. The histogram you can read uh, pretty nicely. That's what it's showing in these blue bars. And then I can plot the actual distribution from which those histogram uh, was drawn. It's a, a normal distribution spelled out there. Uh, and this is what it gives you. So you can see it's uh, a nice uh, capability. Um, the best way, I think, if you actually want to learn uh, how to make some kind of plot um, in matplotlib is to look at the gallery. So there's a link at the bottom of this notebook or if you just do a Google search for um, matplotlib gallery. Uh, what this shows is, I don't know, maybe a hundred, a few hundred examples of people who have made all kinds of other plots using Python, NumPy, matplotlib. Uh, and they also have the source code, the source of Python that was used to generate all of these. So say you want to do something that, I don't know, has uh, some subplots or something like that. You can click on here, and down here is the source code that was used uh, to generate all that, introduces you to the subplot feature, um, and shows you how to reproduce a plot like this. And there's a pretty good cross-section of uh, a variety of things. Um, yes? Can you just click on the source code? Copy that URL? And then in the notebook, I've been load pi. Where did my notebook go? Hmm. Let me start off another one. Back one. Oh, that's right. I left it when I created that thing. Sorry. Uh, okay, let's create a new one. New notebook. Okay, load pi. Space and then URL. Uh -huh. There you go. Uh, I'm like, pardon? There you go. There are your plots brought right in. Um, it should be clear in case it isn't before that. The number of commits that I've made to the IPython notebook uh, is somewhat smaller than the number that Paul has. Um, but that's all right. It shows you that you don't actually need to understand all the guts of these things, I think, uh, to do some nice stuff. Uh, all right. So that is everything I think that I wanted to cover. Does anyone have any more questions at this point before we get into the breakout stuff? All right. The breakout problem, which I shamelessly stole from uh, Fernando. Uh, for this, let me close some of these, find out where it is, there we go. There's uh, also on the uh, agenda web page is uh, the breakout problem in uh, PDF and also in all the notebook formats. The basic idea is that we want you first uh, to reproduce within Python the trapezoid rule. If you're unfamiliar with the trapezoid rule, this is a way to do numerical integration. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of background here where you're just essentially linearly interpolating taking the difference uh, between two points on this curve and uh, summing up the area as you sort of step along uh, to get um, the integral, an approximation for the integral of a given function. So the first thing that we ask you to do is write a function called the trapezoid that applies the trapezoid formula. If I give it two arrays uh, to actually do uh, this sort of uh, trapezoid calculation. Uh, next, once you've mastered that, uh, write a function, write a, a routine that will take a function f, endpoints a and b, and the number of sample points to take, sample that function uniformly at these points, and return the value of the integral. 
Okay, so now you're actually taking some function, uh, calculating it at certain points on a grid, seeing the, uh, you know, take a simple function that you can easily integrate, seeing how the trapezoid rules compares to that, depending on how many points you're doing. Uh, show that uh, these are correct by uh, working on a few very simple functions. And if you get all the way down to the end, that would be great. Um, see how that changes as you actually change uh, how fine your sampling is on that point. Just so you know, uh, this shouldn't be too complicated. I mean, the trapezoid rule can be done with just one or two uh, lines of Python code if you're doing the uh, indexing of your arrays in a smart way. Again, this shouldn't be done uh, with like four loops and stuff like that. It can be done much faster than that. So we'll give you like 10 or 15 minutes, I guess, to work on that. I think what we'll do, because we're running a little bit late, is also give you the homework problem and then have uh, people who want to stay uh, start working on the breakout, maybe do the breakout solution um, at the end, and then we'll, we'll, um, we'll go over the homework in the morning. Okay. So if you can reload that. Click on PDF. Okay, so um, we want to get you comfortable working with um, with NumPy arrays and get you comfortable doing some plots. Um, we'll ask you basically to use this um, comma separated file called trends.csv, which is posted on the agenda site. Um, and uh, using matplotlib, um, there's a way to read that in, something called CSV to rec. Um, and you can also use something called load text if you like. There's a bunch of different ways to read in CSV files nicely. Um, uh, and then try to make a plot that essentially reproduces this. What is this? This is a search on Google Trends for a bunch of different words as people are searching on Google. And you can see that there's some seasonality associated with this. Spring break, which is in blue, um, tends to come right around spring break and right before. You can see when people start thinking about it. Textbooks, which I've spelled wrong up there, um, you can see that you wind up getting a lot of searches on that twice a year. You can imagine when that happens. Skiing, you can see which year has probably had a couple of different snowstorms around the country by looking at the double peaks and kayaking or something. Um, so uh, try to reproduce this plot as faithfully as possible using um, what we've given you there. Go to the next one. And we're going to actually try to do some numerics on this, try to get some insight out of that data, determine in which week of the uh, each year for all five search trends, including global warming, which is not plotted uh, there, um, that that search uh, reached its peak and minimum. Are there any trends you can spot with any of the terms? That is. Are some of them drifting later in time or some of them drifting earlier in time? Which term is the largest scatter about its median value? Which term is the smallest scatter? Determine the time lag in units of weeks that maximizes the cross correlation between skiing and spring break. Uh, do this for skiing and global warming. Perhaps you'll find something and you can publish it in nature. Um, download uh, whatever trend data you like of your own and sort of repeat um, this process. Um, so hopefully that's pretty clear. If you go to the next slide, you don't have to do anything. With, oh, we'll just give you a couple of hints. Um, you probably want to get started with something like this in your various scripts. You can, of course, do this in the notebook and turn that in if you'd like. Um, and uh, NumPy has some nice tools for cross-correlation, so you don't have to do that all yourself. If you don't know what cross-correlation is, look it up. Um, and uh, hopefully you'll have some fun with this. Go to the next slide. Uh, just to show you, you won't have to do anything with this trend data that Python relative to Java, relative to IDL, or MATLAB is taking off. So you're definitely in the right boot camp. It's good you to go to the IDL boot camp this morning. Uh, and I, I hope um, as we finish the first day of the boot camp that um, you've really seen yourself uh, as a Python programmer in the future. We really only just touched on the surface. We've got two more full days of teaching you uh, about Python and software carpentry. So we hope to see you tomorrow morning. Um, if you go back to the schedule, there will be um, a discussion led by, um, uh, led by Eric uh, tomorrow morning of the uh, homework. And I, I think you can also go over any questions about um, the previous breakout. 
And we'll start promptly at 8.45 tomorrow with the first lecture, and we'll talk about uh, advanced sort of string I.O. Uh, 